Hey everyone, what's up? Goldie here. Happy Monday, and we're going to be going over the eight-game slate that we've got here for the main uh, over on DK. Um, nice little zone here, I think, with these eight-gamers. Talked about this before. They make for really interesting tournament slates. You can nearly always get to some uh, some pretty cool spots, I think, and, and make some fun sort of ownership and um, pivots and decisions, things like that. So um, same sort of deal here today, and we've got early projections loaded to the site here. Um, and we've got kind of the what you sort of expect, but maybe a little bit of... Uh, I mean, certainly some some early day noise, of course, uh, but maybe a little bit of exploitability in some of these numbers here. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit as we get into the breakdowns here, but um, kind of top heavy. Once again, we've seen this a little bit recently where most of the guys in the top sort of range are, are basically projecting in the in the same sort of area on the on the spectrum right and that usually means that some guys will naturally get a bit more steam than they probably should relative to the others and i think that's kind of what we're seeing here maybe with a, a little bit on logan gilbert and nestor cortez uh, not that these are bad arms or anything like that um but perhaps a, a little bit of value that we might be able to find in in something like a uh, a Freddy Peralta for example against a really good team over here the Dodgers or Marcus Stroman coming in both of these guys a little bit lower ownership and some attackable spots so should they be three time or should Logan Gilbert be 3x the ownership of a Stroman or a Peralta I don't know maybe maybe not um so that's kind of where we are landing down here in the bottom end of the pricing spectrum. Uh, a bunch of pretty low upside arms, I think. Maybe a couple of guys that we'll want to get to or consider getting to. Um, but probably not with all that much regularity and, and heavy exposures or anything like that. We really just don't like red, red numbers, right? So um, that's kind of where we stand for the overall breakdown. Let's just get into the games and see if um, we can once and for all keep this baby under an hour on a shorter game slate. Yeah, we'll see. Um, we'll start with Oakland and New York. J.P. Sears on the mound for the A's in Yankee Stadium. And Nestor for the Yanks. 6,300 for J.P. Sears. Um, the Arsenal this this so far this year is, has been a lot better. Um it's allowing him to survive a little bit here, and he's, he's still not getting enough value out of this four-seamer, um, and that's really kind of why the Yankees traded him, to be quite honest, or, or were happy with uh, letting him go. Uh, it, it's fastball command and really not a lot of extreme value, you know, to the upside at least, uh, on the four-seamer, and that with just two other pitches makes it a little bit difficult for a starter if you don't have really good fastball command and and good value on a four-seamer uh, or a, or a two-seamer or a cutter or whatever. But uh, he's only got the, the four-seam fastball. And here in the early going this season, whatever, five starts or something for J.P. Sears, that really hasn't changed. The usage on... The other pitches are basically static as well, throwing a little bit less of the change in favor of the slider more, which is good. Uh, but seeing a real big drop off in the in the change of value so far, and that's kind of concerning. Throwing a little bit more of this cutter, um, but it's still very minimal usage. It's probably just a miscategorization of a slider. Most of the of the usage now is is going over to the slider, so he's only at about 10% or so, uh, 10 to 12% of the changeup. Still a shorter sample, so we'll see how that fleshes out over the rest of the year. But migrating a little bit of what's historically been a, a pretty good pitch, 
uh, over to one of his really good pitches. So that that's a, a certainly a plus, right? But we're still struggling with the with the four seamer value here, and I think that's going to get him into some dangerous spots here against the Yankees. They can still go pretty right-handed heavy, of course, even though they're missing all of their or a few of their uh, all of their power hitters and a few of their really high upside bats. They still have Volpe, Glaber, DJ Bader, who is back um, from the right side. Ozzy Cabrera, he's got pop. Ozzy Peraza's got a little bit of pop. Uh, IKF does not, but he is apparently a six-hole hitter for the Yankees. So some attack ability for the Yankees in this lineup, just because overall they're they're still pretty weak, but probably not enough to put me onto a JP Sears here. Um, in in just scripting teams or whatever, it's going to be pretty hard, even at a a 6,300 cheap price tag, to get to a lot of just a uh, an average median projection here, I should say, um, at 11 points, give or take, against a pretty right-handed heavy lineup. Uh, and he still gives up pop because this changeup, as I mentioned, he's, he's losing a lot of value. It's nowhere near this. It's it's about two outs below, um, two and three outs below league average so far in value. And throwing it still, you know, 12% of the time or whatever. So... Very vulnerable to the to opposite-handed hitters still if he's got a bad four-seamer and a bad change now. He's basically just a one-pitch guy, which will make him or keep him good against the left side, which we're not really worried about because the Yankees are, are going to platoon very heavily here. So I think we could get to some Yankee stacks. Uh, definitely, they're at very playable prices, and you could correlate with Nestor on the mound as well. 9400 for him. I'm just worried about this ownership. The Arsenal has actually not been fantastic so far this season, even though it typically is. Now, the cutter is still just an elite pitch, and he's moved a little bit more of the usage from the four-seamer over to the cutter. But the breaking stuff has not been good. Losing a lot of value on the slider and the changeup is Nestor. And not getting near as much value out of this four-seamer that he has in the past, still using it at roughly the same but he's migrating a bit more of the usage over to the cutter, and he's up to about 33, 34% now, and he's sacrificing, um, what is he sacrificing here? Some of the, he's not throwing this, this curveball at all still, and the changeup is still kind of hovering in the same range. So sacrificing some of the slider, which is, you know, just kind of a, a league average pitch, and so far this season has also really not been good. The changeup is still bad. And the four-seamer so far this year has really not been good either. So he's battling the command, and he's battled some health stuff. Obviously, he was hurt earlier in the year, and he got torched by Texas in his last start. Evidently, he was dealing with strep throat then as well. So that's something we'd have to keep in mind here. But his four-seamer, historically you know, up there with the cutter, um, a, a very good mix has not been good at all. And he, he's losing a lot to the field on the, on those, on that pitch in, uh, in particular, still throwing this change, getting blasted there as well. So that's going to make him a hell of a lot more susceptible to opposite handed hitters. So I think you could actually consider getting to a couple of short Oakland stacks here. Now I, I don't want to target Nestor in general, because I respect this cutter. It's a very, very good pitch. However, if 40% ownership with bad fastball value and bad fastball command, he's basically a one-pitch guy now with extreme negative value on the slider and the changeup. And as I mentioned, extreme negative value on the, on the four-seamer here too. So in the early going. Um, it's a suppression spot for him against Oakland because they're they're pretty bad and generally pretty low upside, but against lefties here, they're actually creating at a 106 WRC plus this season, 22% aggregate K rate, 151 ISO is average. I mean, this is these are fine numbers and not nearly as attackable uh, as Oakland is, you know, with with right-handers necessarily. So, so I'm not going to hit for a lot of hard contact, but 
they can get get to baseball in the air, and that plays here a little bit at Yankee Stadium. So at 40% ownership with a very suspect arsenal change um, in terms of value, the, I think this may be a little bit uh, – we might be getting carried away here at, at 40% here. Um, it's not to say that Oakland can't fix – whatever is going on with Nestor's four-seamer, like, they certainly can, right? But uh, 94, it's a slightly elevated price tag. I think the median projection is probably okay. I think this is fine in cash. Uh, in tournaments, though, I think there is a bit of variance that's not baked into this 40% ownership figure. So I think we could probably get to some Oakland plays on the other side with guys like Anastiri Ruiz, who's been fantastic. Brent Rooker has probably the most pop. 3,900, 31 for Ruiz. Those price tags very playable. Ramon Laureano, 34, very playable as well. Jesus Aguilar didn't strike out at all. 2,800 for him. You can get to either guy behind the plate. Carlos Perez at the stone min at 2,000. Shea behind the plate as well. At 35, also playable. So um, you can mix in some stacks here. Probably shorter stacks I think I'd prefer with Oakland since they, you know, this is still Nestor. He's still a good arm. And it could just be early season noise on this four-seamer here. But uh, I think it's attackable, and in the early going here, this um, this ownership figure may be a little bit high. It's not to say I don't want to play any Nestor or anything like that. I'll certainly have uh, some pretty healthy exposure to him, but uh, probably coming in under the field at this current number. Uh, I do want to get to some Yankees, though, however, and attack this real big change in the change value for J.P. Sears over here, uh, mostly with righties. And um, so I, I think we can get to some off, sneaky offense here. Probably not sneaky from the Yankees' perspective, but perhaps a little bit from Oakland. Okay, Dodgers and the Brewers. Gonsolin on the mound, 7,300. Uh, I'm starting to like this a little bit. He is now, I think, stretched out enough to the point where we can consider playing him. And the price tag is still basically the same as it was at the beginning of the season. And he's got enough in this arsenal here value-wise, suppression-wise, to pop through this price tag pretty significantly. And we were paying 10 k plus for the guy last year. So um, nothing has changed. The Everything in the arsenal, it through his first two starts at least, uh, is the basically the exact same. So we don't have anything to worry about there. Uh, price tag is good, and he's now going to be stretched out to probably 85 to 90 pitches, and that's the range that we need to get into with Gonsolin when he was limited to whatever, four innings and, and 65 pitches. We just couldn't touch that. But now we're getting into um, you know a 50% bump into, into pitch count. Like that, now we're talking. So I think this is a playable price tag for Gonsolin here at 7,300. Do I really want to go after the Brewers? Um, in general, eh, I'm kind of lukewarm on it. Average K rate, they walk a lot, and they don't hit for as much power as perhaps last year, but they're still a little bit sticky to get through, still making a good bit of hard contact. The problem for Milwaukee, at least to this point compared to last year, is they're hitting far more balls on the ground and not in the air. So they're having a little bit of trouble scoring compared to last season. But overall, don't generally want to target them because they're kind of sticky. They still can platoon and and stay pretty balanced. Uh, Yelich is actually still hitting the ball very hard. Not a lot of upside for him, uh, at least compared to his MVP year or anything like that. Uh, Winker has been awful. Rowdy Tellez has been great. And Bryce Terang has been a, a nice sort of cheap piece uh, down at second base who they're platooning a little bit. So they can get to you from the left side and, and stay pretty balanced because they, they have some pretty decent right-handed hitters as well that historically have hit righties okay. Uh, Willie Adamas is all right. He'll strike out a, a little bit, uh, but William Contreras is fine behind the plate. Brian Anderson fine as well. So not my favorite usually going after the Brewers, but I think this is an upside spot for Gonsolin at this particular price tag. And I like the ownership mostly. Now, the median projection, we're still playing with Dave Roberts and all this kind of jazz here over here. So he could very well, once again, just go four and two-thirds and, and throw 70 pitches and you're just kind of, kind of boned. But I think there's upside at this price and this particular ownership figure. So that's really the only thing we've got to be 
mindful of, I think. Um, if we're looking for regression for Tony Gonsolin, uh, it's not really going to come in the arsenal necessarily because every every batted ball metric looks great. This strand rate, however, is exceptionally high for anybody with a large sample. 84% is a big, big number. And we do see a little bit of a delta here in the raw run suppression metrics. 220 ERA with a 380 XFIP. If there's regression that's going to surface, it's going to come in this strand rate, and this is going to drop. But overall, I mean, in order to to score runs, I mean, people got to get on base first, and they don't really do that against Gonsolin in, a, in aggregate here. 169 average to lefties and 184 average allowed to righties. So they're not hitting for pretty much anything here. And so I think this is a viable spot to get to some Gonsolin. Um, and what's a very plus arsenal? Splitter, still a really good pitch. Slider curveball, still very good value here so far as well. So I think we can we can work with this and we can work with this price tag and definitely this ownership figure. On the other side, Freddie Peralta on the mound, 8,600 for him against Dodgers. Well, I mean, this is a super high variance spot, I think, for Freddie. Now, we played him in his last start um, at Coors Field against the Rockies and he struck out like 10 or something like that. So he was great. I think that same sort of K upside is here for Freddie. Um yeah, but once again, like there, there's upside here for attacking the Dodgers with right-handers. They've not been good in terms of the strikeouts uh, this season, striking out a lot more, so far more in favor of the three true outcomes, high strikeouts, high walk rate, high power, and a lot of creation, of course. So it's a super dangerous and highly variant spot for Freddie the arsenal isn't really the problem. It's it, That's never been there. It, it, he's always thrown gas, and he's always been able to get to some decent breaking stuff. Curveball, really, really good pitch. He'll be able to throw that more a little bit in this outing than he could have at the Coor, in the Coors Field start. We still struck out 10 there, right? And the Rockies are striking out at basically the same clip as the Dodgers. Um, or I should say that the other way around. Dodgers striking out at basically the same clip against righties this year, as are the Rockies. So, it's still a hitter ballpark here in Milwaukee, but um, the arsenal for Freddie is going to play a little bit better at his home park than it would have uh, at Coors Field, of course. So, I think we can attack this, but we have to be careful because the only problem that we've ever had with Freddie is just fastball command. It's throwing strikes and walking people. He has gotten it under control over the last couple of seasons, but he's still vulnerable, as we see here, with a full 10% walk rate to the left side over his last 112 and two-thirds. So uh, 52 and two-thirds to the lefties. 10% walks is 10%, and there's a lot of guys from the left side of the plate that, that will walk over here. Freddie will walk. Muncie, definitely. David Peralta will walk a little bit. So... Um, They've got plenty of lefties over here that can make this difficult in terms of elevating the pitch count for Freddie. I think it's a fine price tag. I don't think there's a hell of a lot of value that we could necessarily squeeze out of this. So getting to him, getting a little bit of exposure to him, I think is, is perfectly warranted. The medium projection looks fine here so far. Maybe a tick high, I would say. Um, so if I had to choose, I'd probably side with the Dodgers at lower aggregate ownership for them than Freddie. If Freddie came in at 22, 25% or something like that, then I'd definitely side with the Dodgers. If Freddie came in at about 5%, then I'd probably have to side with Freddie. So um, we're kind of right in the middle here, and I'm not sure there's a, a ton of value really to be squeezed out in either direction so far. I prefer getting to the Dodgers at this point just because their pricing in aggregate is a is pretty attackable for the Dodgers, to be quite honest. Uh, 55 for Mookie is fine. 49 for Freddie. We're starting to get into territory below 5K for Freddie, where we just got to play him. And Will Smith at 51. He's been great since he came back off the concussion list. And Max Muncie has also been fine as well. 52, that's a playable price in hitter's ballpark here. So you can get to some cheaper guys like a Hayward or a David Peralta if you want. Miguel Vargas, he's been fantastic over the last couple of weeks. So 
Um, Outman, of course, hit a, a three-run bomb in the 10th inning, I believe, yesterday. And I think it's so they've got plenty of guys over here to do the Dodgers um, to make this a little bit difficult on Freddie. So I'm not super thrilled about getting outsized exposures to him here. And you know, I, I like playing a little bit of the Dodgers. I'll have some, certainly, because they're coming in at pretty medial ownership right now. And there might be about five or six other teams that will probably see some more ownership. So I think that a lot of playable spots there, Gonsolin, the Dodgers, and maybe a little bit of Freddie as well. I'm mostly off of the Brewers. Uh, not super interested in, in attacking Gonsolin. I, I think I'd prefer his side there. Okay, let's move on to the White Sox and the Royals here. Dylan Cease on the mound, 9,700. Now, we like this ownership for Cease, okay? But our problem with Cease is that he cannot throw it over the damn plate. Like, he is just walking way too many people. He once again walked four guys in his last outing. Like, he's had one start this season. I'd call it two starts this season where he's walked only one. Yeah, nobody or or just one guy. And in the in the start where he walked one guy, it was Tampa, and he gave up three runs and only struck out five and lasted four innings, right? So he elevates his pitch count because he has trouble throwing strikes and staying ahead in counts. And unfortunately for him, this four-seamer value this season has been uh, pretty terrible. He is throwing it basically at the same usage, but... He's he's lost. He's losing about um, you know a quarter of an out to the field on the four seamer. That's because he's not been able to throw it for any more of a strike. The split over here still not using it uh, a whole hell of a lot. Roughly the same usage. Slider is down a little bit. And he's throwing a little bit more of the curveball, which is not good. So. He's getting less value out of his four-seamer, and he's throwing less of his really good pitch in the slider in favor of a really bad pitch in the curveball. So that's not really a good recipe here, and a kind of an elevated price tag still for Dylan Cease. We still have variance concerns because he walks the whole country. So I'm not overly interested in this. I do like the ownership figure here, um, and he's naturally, because of the high K rate and the high swinging strike stuff, going to project very well against the Royals. And this is a plus matchup. Could the Royals solve his four-seamer command issues? Uh, maybe, because they're not walking a whole hell of a lot in aggregate so far this year. Just a 7% walk rate in you know 900-plus PAs against righties. 75, 75 WRC+, plus and a 139 ISO, 284 Woba. So they're, they're not getting on base a whole hell of a lot hitting for just a 226 average against the right side. So um, you can attack this absolutely with a very high strikeout arm in Dylan Cease, but their aggregate walk rate is probably going to tick up a little bit before Dylan Cease's aggregate walk rate ticks down because, I mean, he's the one that's got to throw strikes, and he clearly has a problem against everybody. It's not just bad teams. So um, they'll hit for a little bit of hard contact here. 34% is a pretty damn big number and they'll get the baseball in the air so i think this is an okay spot where you could also target some high variance with dylan cease by getting to a couple royals teams if you want to play some of these lefties i would like getting to a little bit of mj 37 i think this is a fine price tag you play Vinny, of course you're never leaving him off of any royal stacks if you get there bobby witt and and salvi behind the plate i mean there are playable price tags 52 and 44, respectively. But high, high K rate against the right side. And, and Bobby Witt will swing and miss a little bit still, of course. And Salvi's main problem is chase. He's got one of the highest chase rates in baseball. And that's going to make it a little bit difficult because Dylan C's best pitch still is the slider. And he'll throw that down out of the strike zone. And he's got some good chase. So I think that make it makes it uh, a little bit of a difficult spot for Salvi. So probably prefer some short lefty stacks here. K rate's a little bit lower to the left side than it is to righties. Some walk susceptibility there. He'll walk the right side too. So um, I think this is an attackable spot for just a couple of these really good lefties 
for the Royals, Vinny and MJ in particular, you can play Nick Prado as well. You can play him in the outfield because um, you're definitely playing Vinny if you do this. He's 2,400, so makes it very cheap to get to, and you'll get a little bit of leverage on the field because I would imagine that Dylan Cease's ownership is probably going to steam a tiny bit throughout the day. Uh, but the the variance with him is really going to keep this down. I'm not wild about, once again, paying nearly 10K for a guy that has walk problems. I'm just not super interested. Um, this is the Royals, and they're bad. So you can play him, of course, but getting a full 25% of Dylan Cease, I don't know. I think there's plenty of other guys we'd probably rather get to that don't have this walk problem. Um, Zach Greinke on the other side. Even though he's, what, 4300 cheaper, we can't play Granky. But we did talk about in his last start how sometimes it is super frustrating to stack against Granky and that we were looking probably for a bounce. He just doesn't get blown up all that often. And he gave up seven earned um, in his start. Uh, who was it against? It was against uh, Minnesota. It just lasted three and two-thirds, gave up seven earned. And came back and bounced really hard, went a full five innings, didn't give up any production against Baltimore. Pop for 19.5 DK points at roughly the same price. He only threw 44 pitches, and he got yanked after five innings. I'm not sure what we're, what Quattrara is doing over there, but, um, you know, like he was fantastic. And Grinke very well could have lasted a full seven innings in that start against Baltimore. Um, so he has this upside in him. I mean, it's like... It's not like playable upside in tournaments or anything because he's had 20 DK points like four times in the last two years. So that's not really what we want to target. The real decision point here is whether we play the White Sox. And they're coming in at, as the most popular team so far in early ownership runs. And like I said, I, I generally hate stacking against Zach Greinke. It's very rare that he... He gives up a full seven spot. Now, you can, tar you can target him. He'll give up three runs or whatever, and there's immense upside going after the Royals' bullpen. And that's really what you're focused on. If he's only going to throw a max of five innings, regardless of how many pitches he throws, then there's upside to go after four innings of the, Roy of the Royals' bullpen for sure. So you can get to some White Sox, but at their current ownership levels, um, they're coming in very, very popular, certainly the most popular team. I probably tend to shy away from that, and I would prefer getting to maybe just some shorter stacks of, of the White Sox. Tim Anderson, definitely at 54. You can play Luis Robert as well at 42. Ben Intendi, he's going to pop really hard in value metrics today, 3,100 for sure. Um, everybody else, though, I'm not super interested in playing. They're really not all that good of an offense. So 23% uh, aggregate K rate, 86 WRC plus, still not hitting for power, and they're missing Eloy Jimenez now. Maybe getting Yoan Moncada back. Uh, could be activated today, so that would certainly help. And he's had a fine rehab start as far as production goes, so that would definitely help the, the upside of the lineup here and would turn me on to the White Sox a little bit more. But overall, I still don't like stacking against Granke. He's just a pitcher, and he's, he's very hard to get there against a lot of the time because he only gives up three runs, and and that's pretty much all the production that you see. So um, overall, would side certainly with offense in this game, and yeah, sure, with the White Sox, but I think you could play a couple of short Royal stacks and target some variants here in Dylan Cease. I don't like this price tag on him, and I certainly I still don't like the walk rate. Okay, Miles Michaelis and Marcus Stroman on the mound for the Cards and the Cubs. Cards finally broke out yesterday. Um, I mean, if you want to consider it a breakout, their their offense has been good all season, and they've been producing. It's just the pitching staff that has been bad. Miles Michaelis has been one of those really poor performers for them so far this year. And even at 6,000, like we talked about this a couple of times with Michaelis, there's upside for him to pop to 25 points if he suppresses and doesn't give up any runs. But in the events where he does give up runs, he just doesn't have the raw K stuff to blow through anybody and, and make up that deficit. So it makes it incredibly difficult for him because he's very likely to give up a couple of runs. He pitches to a lot of contact, 83% here. 
And here in the early going, he has migrated um, a little bit of his slider usage uh, to the curveball. It's mostly mostly the same, but you know a tick or two here or there. So it could just be some early season sort of noise. Um, still throwing the change up a little bit. It's still a bad pitch with extreme negative value. His sinker, where he does usually get a lot of value in keeping the baseball down in the strike zone, is actually getting blown apart pretty good. His four-seamer's been bad, and the sinker has been bad. And with a bad change, that's going to make him really susceptible. His curveball is, is normally just about league average. Same with the slider. He's getting a little bit more value this season out of the slider than these aggregate numbers show over the last season plus. Um, but the curveball has been a little bit worse. So it's basically neutral here. And all of the fastball value that he's gotten in, in the past has basically disappeared. So he's throwing all of this stuff up in the strike zone. It's leading to more fly balls and a lot more hard contact and a lot more power. So I think he's mostly attackable here with the Cubs rather than attackable with a, a $6,000 price tag. Now, it is 50 degrees in Chicago tonight, and you've got a 10, 15-mile-an-hour wind blowing in. So that doesn't really incite too much confidence for playing the Cubs offense, and they're expensive. You want to play 5900 for Nico Horner? Like, geez, man, what are we doing? I love Nico, but come on. Uh, Dansby at 5, that would be fine in general for him. Um, like him more against lefties, of course. Ian Happ, 52, Suzuki, 47, and Belly is finally up to 4,800. So uh, you get to pay for Patrick Wisdom now down in the 8 hole since they've called up a couple of guys at 49 still. So still very difficult to stack the Cubs, so I'm not wild about going after those prices. If you want to take some shorts on, on the Cubs because of that pricing and a long position on Miles Michaelis here at 6,000, I think that's okay. But once again, the, the fastball mix here this season has not been good at all. So I'd much rather still just go to the Cubs, and I don't really want to do that either. Uh, pretty poor hitting environment here, so I'm not super interested in in the Cardinals, especially the day after they put up 26 runs or whatever they did. And Goldschmidt, you want to you want to chase a three homer day uh, at a $600 price bump to yesterday, He's 6K now. Um, not too excited about that. So. And certainly, like, do, do we want to play the Cardinals against Marcus Stroman? I mean, not really. He, his stuff has been overall pretty damn good this year. Uh, the usage is basically static, but he's throwing less of the changeup. He's migrated it over to a little bit more of the slider. A couple ticks here or there, nothing crazy. But throwing the, the cutter another couple ticks higher and still staying off of the four-seamer a little bit. Um, you know, just kind of a, a show me four seamer, but he's got it in the bag. And overall, still a very high ground ball pitcher with a little bit of K stuff. He's e eking value out of every single one of his pitches, and they've all been really, really good, including the the four seamer and even the change up so far this year. So he's throwing the change less and he's getting more value out of it. So perhaps that is leading to a little bit of the early season increase in whiff stuff and, and strikeout numbers that we've seen. Now, over the last several starts, that's dropped off a little bit and Stroman regressing back to the Stroman that we kind of know and love. But that said, there's still a little bit of a change in the arsenal here, and it's an encouraging change because he's, he's eking a lot of value, definitely out of the, out of the full fastball mix here. Um, but if he can neutralize this bad change of value which he seems to be doing that makes him like super deadly and that's a full five pitch mix here that he's getting at worst uh in the four seamer at least league average value out of so that makes him very playable at 8800 i'm not super thrilled about the price tag we once again with a high ground ball rate and historically low strikeout pitcher have upside questions but this is a high medium projection so far. Do you want to go after the Cardinals? Eh, generally, no. But once again, this is a terrible hitting weather over here. And I'd much rather get to Stroman than, than side with the cards trying to hit the baseball through a 15-mile-an-hour wind at Wrigley. Uh, no thanks. Um, good off-season, or early-season numbers, rather, 
for the cards, of course, 21% K rate to righties, 255 average allowed, 158 ISO, still hitting the ball very, very hard, and starting to create, starting to see the normalization in their offensive numbers in, in terms of uh, run scoring to their underlying metrics, of course, but still, it's, it's 50 degrees with 15 mile an hour winds. No thanks. I'd rather get to Stroman. I, I think the 13% ownership figure here is playable and I think we can get to this uh, a little bit probably don't want to get too crazy with it maybe like with 25% of our teams or anything but um, maybe a little bit of leverage about 2x the field at 20% at or so I think is probably all right with Stroman here but there's a lot of guys in this 8 to 9k range I think we could play so it's probably going to keep his ownership down which makes him a fine tournament play with the increased value in the in the arsenal okay Let's move on to a spot I really like. Hunter Brown here against the Angels. 9,200 for him. Um, lower medium projection and very low ownership here. I love this. And I'm going to attack this pretty hard today, I think. The only a real change here so far, and we can't really call it a change. We've got a very short sample on Hunter Brown as it is. But he's throwing the four-seamer a little bit less. He's dropped this about five, six ticks, and he's throwing... More of the slider. Uh, this is up to about 35% now, and this is an elite pitch here. Uh, still getting fine value out of the four-seamer. It's basically break-even, which is basically what this figure is, which is, is fine. And now that the league is getting a bit more of a book on him, that four-seamer value was pretty unlikely to stay that high. So it's drifting back down to league average at this point, and he's moving a little bit of, the, of that usage over to the slider, still throwing the curveball at uh, about 31% or so, um, and and still throwing the the changeup of very little here in the in the early going this year. But uh, this is basically just about a, a six to eight tick click uh, click over to the slider from the four seamer here and he's still getting fantastic value on the on the slider so we want to attack the angels mostly with right handers and we want to attack with chase so he can throw this slider ken hunter brown for a strike he can also bury it a little bit and that's really how we want to go after the angels here average k rate in in aggregate 102 wrc plus all of these numbers are average but I think they're going to have a little bit of a difficult time here because he still has plus value uh, on the four seamer. He can still spot this, and this is an elite slider, you know, an elite breaking pitch with the slider here. The curveball is still very, very good, and seeing roughly the same value on that as well. So uh, at very low ownership, I think Hunter Brown is a, a real good target here, targeting the Angels, um, even though the offense is starting to kind of come around a little bit. Saw so, uh, Anthony Rendon finally hit a, a bomb this season uh, yesterday, I believe. So if you want to play Trout and Otani, I think that's okay and still target a, a young arm with a little bit of, of variance. The negative regression, uh, I guess, in the, in the four-seamer, it's really coming because he hasn't been able to spot it deeper in the count. So... Perhaps a little bit vulnerable to walking some guys. That'll mostly come to lefties. They don't have a lot of lefties they're going to throw in the lineup here. So it's really, what, Shohei, Matt Thice, maybe a Renjifo, um, perhaps a Jake Lamb who's terrible. Three, four lefties max maybe. Um, outside of that, it's the righties, and we don't want to go near him because his slider is so good. So um, I, I prefer siding with, with Hunter Brown here. Low median projection so far. But I think we could squeeze a, a good bit of value on him. There's a lot of upside. He could pop for 30 very reasonably in this spot. And I think this is an attackable price at attackable ownership. Patty on the mound for the Angels, 6,900. I just can't do it with Patty. Um, the K stuff has really never been there. But Patty's actually going the wrong direction here. He's throwing less of the sinker this season and throwing more of the four-seamer. And that's not that's not what we want to be doing. Sinker was a pretty good and valuable pitch for him, and he's migrating some of that usage 
to a worse pitch in the four seamer, and we don't want to we don't want to deal with that. Um, and the sinker itself really hasn't been all that valuable for him either. So he's only throwing it. Uh, I mean, he's what dropped it down to about seven percent, seven eight percent or so, and he's migrated all of that usage to the four seamer. And the value on the four seamer still pretty bad, but the value on the on the sinker is two and three times worse than this, right? So he, he's losing about an out and a half or two to the field relative to gaining an out and a half or two that he was in aggregate last year. That's why I was really so excited about playing Patty a lot coming into this year, but the sinker has not been good. So he's got bad, bad fastballs here, and that really puts him in a terrible spot. The changeup has actually been pretty damn good this season so far, throwing this a little bit more and a little bit less of the slider. So there's it's encouraging in that respect. But he still needs to be able to spot and work off of this fastball mix in order to allow him to get deeper into counts and realize a little bit of swing and miss. Um, so I'm not encouraged at all by the, the migration of the sinker to the four-seamer usage here. And changeup is really been league average and he's, he's seeing quite outsized performance on that pitch so far this year compared to its history so i think we might see a little bit of regression in that value as well i'd like to get to some of the astros here it's kind of a, a middling and off the board stack very playable price tags of course for even kyle tucker now at 5100 you could play a lefty here if you'd like uh, the slider's a very good pitch for Patty still, so not my favorite going after same-handed hitters. Um, they're playing same-handed hitters against him, but you can always play Jordan. You can play him literally against everybody. He hits lefties fantastic. L Kyle Tucker a little bit more susceptible, but the rest of the lineup is right-handed. So, uh, And they're all very playable at a pretty approachable price tags. Mo Dubon, 3,600, that's fine, doesn't strike out. Alex Bregman doesn't strike out 4,400, also fine. Josie Abreu is washed, but 3,600, maybe I can um, I can kind of tilt him into uh, getting there a little bit. Jeremy Pena, still pretty expensive, 45 for him down in the six, but a playable price tag for sure because you have Corey Jolks and the guys like a David Hensley or uh, maybe a Chaz, who I believe is back who you can play down cheaper at the bottom of the lineup. So I would much rather get to Houston. You only have to lay about a, do uh, a quarter on them into betting markets right now. I think this is an okay and very attackable uh, spot for Houston in general. And this off or this ballpark's going to play up offense a little bit. So um, now do you want to play a Trout Otani? Sure, on the other side. But would mostly side with the Astros offensively here and and just some Hunter Brown. I like this spot for him, and I'm encouraged by the Arsenal and not encouraged at all by the Arsenal from Patty. Okay, Texas-Seattle, uh, 7,700 on the mound for John Gray. Can't really do this. Um, like He's moving slider usage over to a bit more of the curveball and the change this season, and that's not good. Like, <laughs> he's going the wrong way, too. His four-seamer has been dreadful as well. Still throwing it, at, you know, full 50% of the time nearly, about 47 so far, but he's increased the usage of the changeup, and it has not been good. So he's lost all of the value on the change so far this year, and he's lost all of the value not being able to spot any of this four-seamer at all. He's losing two and a half outs to the league here. Uh, so far this season. So um, bad fastball, commensurately bad changeup that we talk about all the time. And he's not throwing near as much of the of the good slider here. He, he's dropped this usage down to about 30% rather than the 35. So we need to be throwing more of the good pitches, less of the bad. And that's not really what's happening here. He tr is trying to throw more of the change, but... Velo-wise, it's converging a little bit with his four-seamer, and he can't spot the four-seamer. So that's really always been the susceptibility with John Gray. It's fastball command and staying off of a vulnerable pitch in the changeup to left-handed hitters. And we're seeing the the power numbers creep up a little bit against John. 169 ISO to the left side and a sub-20% K rate now is starting to 
now that we've got six starts on the guy or whatever this year, starting to get a little bit more weight on the recent starts in these numbers. 342 Woba, it's, it's pretty big. 264 average allowed to lefties, still pretty big. So I think you could play some of the some of the Mariners here, but you can also play some of the righties because the fastball has been bad as well. I don't want to go crazy with it because the slider is still a very good pitch for him um, and still eking out a lot of value. But he's throwing, as I mentioned, more of this curveball. He's about doubled the usage of this curveball this season, and it's still a bad pitch. So uh, he's going the wrong direction overall, and that makes him you know, with suspect four-seamer value here. That makes him very vulnerable to both sides of the plate. So I think we can get to some Mariners uh, as well. Now, this is, you know, a night game in Seattle, so kind of hard to get there generally. Um, but you can play some Julio. He's 58, and you got to pay for that. But Ty France at 38, that's very playable now. 45 for Kelnick still is probably about where he should be, I think. But some of these other guys, like a Cal Raleigh, I think this is a fine spot at 4,100. Tay Oscar's down to 38. Gino Suarez in the middle at 36. They they make it a little bit cheaper. You could play uh, a Josie Caballero at 2,300 if you need. Taylor Trammell in the outfield if you need at 26. That's fine, too. I think you could get to some really contrarian Seattle stacks here. You're going to be kind of off the board because I'm not, I'm not enthused at all about this arsenal change here for John Gray. I like the price tag in general for him, and you could see a bit of a bounce because generally we do like targeting Seattle with some righties, 25% aggregate K rate and average in literally every other metric. So that's usually fine. And if he can spot this fastball, he can get there. But um, I'm going to have to side with the Mariners, I think, in most instances. And definitely on the mound as well, Logan Gilbert going for them, 9K. Uh, it, it's okay. 37% ownership, it's pretty high, I think. Uh, I usually don't like going after Texas. This is a very dangerous lineup, man. And Logan Gilbert is a little susceptible to some right-handed power and getting on the barrel. 120 WRC+, plus, 22.5% K rate, 9% walk rate with a 190 ISO. A lot of hard contact here. 36%. This is the highest number split adjusted on the day. So they're going to get the baseball in the air. They have a lot of really good fastball hitters. And Logan Gilbert is migrating. He's making some changes a little bit in the arsenal as well. He's migrating a little bit of this four-seamer usage to far more of the split. He's he's migrated. He's not throwing the the straight change all that much anymore. Um, let's see. Still, yeah, he's completely eliminated the straight change usage, and he's migrated all of it over to a split change. So that's good, but he's throwing less of a historically pretty valuable pitch into four seamer and moving it over to some secondary pitches. So that's that's a little encouraging there, but so far this season still not eking out any value out of the four seamer. It's just league average. And that makes him that increases the variance on the pitch and increases the probability that he'll still give up power to same handed hitters. Two seventy one average Two righties, 329 Woba is not terrible because he doesn't walk anybody, but giving up a 175 ISO to them with just a 20% strikeout rate. The slider for him is still at, a, at about 21, 22% usage or so. The curveball hovering at about the same usage. So he's really taken all of this four seamer usage, dropped this about five, six, eight ticks over here. Moved all of that usage to the splitter and not throwing the, the straight change anymore at all. The value on the on the slider so far has been pretty good, but we need to be careful with this. Cause just a what five six inning example so far. So that's okay. I like seeing more uh, variability in the, in the secondary arsenal and less reliance on a, a league average sort of fastball. So that's encouraging. But with less value out of the fastball, even though there's less usage, he's still throwing it 45, 48% of the time. He, there's still some vulnerability there to same-handed hitters, and this is still a lot of hard contact, 36% to the right side of the plate, 34% to the lefties. So uh, he's not going to walk people and put people on base, which would really make me want to stack Texas uh, on the other side. But I think you can still get to some Texas pieces here and attack some of this very high ownership 
Um, I do like the split change, and I do like the really good slider value so far. So I'd be more inclined to get to high ownership with Gilbert than somebody like Nestor, for example. Um, but I think you could play Texas as well. This is a very dangerous lineup over here. Really, really good team. So I prefer mostly offense in this game, I think. A good bit of Logan Gilbert for sure. But I think the price tag makes me a little bit wary. This is a very high median projection. And I don't know about this. Like, pushing 20 points. He's still got some pretty significant concerns here for me. Um, even though I do really, really like this split change. It's an excellent pitch in general. So I think this is very playable at these numbers. Uh, but just a couple of things to keep in mind. Okay. Uh, last couple of games of the night here, Miami and Arizona. I think we're going to be able to get to some Arizona here. I don't think we could play Braxton Garrett. He's one of these guys, similar to like a, uh, a Kyle Gibson. Pretty, like he just throws everything here and none of it's any good. He This season, he's actually thrown the changeup about the same usage, but not getting any value out of it at all. And same thing with the sinker. So he's had... Poor fastball command. Not a single one of these pitches um, has been good for him this year. I mean, th there's noisy value on this changeup um, here at about five outs above average. So still using it at about, oh, I don't know, 7% of the time. So he's dropped the usage and perhaps decreased the spin rate on it. So it's that's probably what's increasing the value. But overall, he throws... You know, five and even six pitches if he if he mixes in this cutter a little bit, and really none of them are all that impressive. The the changeup is fine, but a, a lot of the um the, you know the breaking stuff value here in the slider and the curveball is really not fine. Curveball getting blasted here, and he's using that a little bit more this season compared to last year. Compared to what this number shows, he's he's up to about twelve and a half, thirteen percent of this pitch itself and he's losing about twice as much value so throwing more of a bad pitch and losing value on it that's not where we want to target slider value still using this uh, a lot and it, it basically hasn't changed so uh, where he's really unfortunately losing a ton of value is is in the two-seamer and throwing a two-seamer to righties as well he's already got problems there he's only going to have this sort of plus change in the events that the sinker is bad also. Um, the four-seamer's been bad, and, and now the sinker is just terrible. So he doesn't have any anything really all that impressive in the arsenal, which is going to make him very attackable. And this offense down here for Arizona really rolling. Uh, you can play pretty much everybody here. I'm, I mean, Corbin Carroll's up to 57 now, so that's kind of stiff in, in a lefty-lefty. Um, he's... Braxton Garrett still has pretty decent numbers left on left, so I'd probably shy a little bit away from, you know, like playing a Corbin Carroll at 57 um, as, a, as a first guy in in my stack or something like that. We mostly want to get to the righties. 193 ISO here, 369 WOBA, and a 303 average allowed. These are big, big numbers. 36% hard contact. So all these guys down here are rolling. Manny Rivera. Is it a playable 3,100? Lourdes hit a couple of bombs yesterday, I believe. He's at 41. Christian Walker's really seeing the baseball also. 4,300 for him. You play long go, too. Anybody down here at the bottom of the lineup, Nick Ahmed has historically hit lefties well. Gabby Moreno, plenty of pop from behind the plate. I think we can get to some Arizona. They'll probably, a top, probably be a top five stack for us uh, when we get to lock. On the mound for... The D-backs is Zach Allen, and yeah, this is the guy I definitely want to get to above 10K. I'd prefer him to cease for sure, and I'm not really worried that he gave up whatever three runs and only struck out six in his last outing um, against Texas. Uh, or, I mean, he got hit around a little bit, didn't quite have his best command. He still went five innings, and like I said, struck out six. So um, not worried at all about Zach Gallen, and we're going to go right back to it. 10, 10 thousands, 10 thousand, and we got to be aware of that. 35% ownership, 35%, but nothing in the arsenal uh, has really changed. Everything is the exact same, and he's throwing a little bit more of the cutter, I believe, this year. Um, mostly, you know, moved a, 
a good bit of the uh, of the four seamer usage, you know, three, four ticks, whatever, over to the cutter slider. So um, just balancing out the arsenal here a little bit, and that's making him even more deadly and difficult to deal with than he has been in the past couple of years. So every metric here is fantastic. Um, no problems with Gallon, and even though we only popped for 13 DK points in his last outing against Texas, we're going to go right back to it because this is a markedly better matchup. Miami, 24.5% K rate in aggregate to righties this year, 79 WRC+. plus, 291 BABIP, it's about average. 286 WOBA, well below average. So no power here, 124 ISO, and a lot of ground balls. 160 ground ball to fly ball with just a 20% line drive rate. So heavy ground balls here uh, for the Marlins so far in the early going. Um, it's mostly because of Luis Arise. But... Uh, there's really only two guys from from the Marlins that I'd consider as like hedge pieces. That'd be Jazz. He hits pretty much every righty in baseball very well. 5,300, that's playable. And Luis Arise. But 4,300, the, the upside for him is sapped a little bit. So mostly off of the Marlins here. And give me pretty much exclusively the D-backs. You only got, I mean, you got to lay $2 on them. Um, so I think that's fine to throw into, you know, whatever, some money line parlays if you want to play that sort of game, something like that. Um, Link two to one here on D-backs. I think it's probably okay, to be honest, if you're into that sort of thing. Not my favorite, but um, in DFS, for sure, we can get to some Zach Gallon 10-2 and play pretty much the entire offense. like that a lot. All right, uh, last game of the day here, Washington and San Francisco. Try and keep this under an hour maybe today. Uh, 5K for Jake Irvin. Still can't play this. Um, now, his first outing was... Uh, encouraging, I guess, if you want to look at some very early and very noisy values in the in the pitch mix. Uh, but he went four and a third, struck out three. He did walk four uh, against the Cubs. So we need to be aware of that. Um, and the Giants are going to pop really hard in pretty much every metric today. Now, this is a game in San Francisco at night, and we usually don't like targeting that with uh, a lot of exposure. It's 55, 60 degrees. Um, wind is always going to play a bit of an issue, play a bit of a role down there and be a bit of an issue because it, it gets up, you know, north of the sort of, um, the, the stadium seating break, if you will, and it starts to swirl a little bit. So things can get a little wild out there in the bay. Um, so there could be some variance with a lot of these San Francisco stacks that we get to against Jake Irvin. He just doesn't have any whiff stuff, and we are really going to want to target that. And it, if he's going to be walking people, that's a, a pretty good recipe as well. The Giants down here, we know this team. They're a, a three true outcome team. They're going to walk, they're going to strike out, and they're going to hit for power. And this is a, a decent spot for them to realize um, the high upside DFS part of that equation hitting for a lot of hard contact here 34 percent it's a big number that's second split adjusted on the slate to texas 118 wrc plus and they're gonna hit the ball in the air so we can of course mix in some giant stacks um they're very playable price tag still lamont wade 32 leading off that's playable uh tyro hit another dinger yesterday 5300 for him uh you can mix him in in stacks one off, not super crazy about that, but you can play Jock definitely. And any of the outfielders, uh, Hanniger, Conforto, uh, you can play JD Davis at third base, 37. Like these guys, guys are all playable, and it's going to increase their ownership a little bit. Um, so no Jake Irvin for us on the mound here. We need to see a little bit more. He's probably not going to be a DFS pitcher for us pretty much at all, and we're going to want to target him uh, most often. D. Sclafani on the mound for the Giants, 8100 I like this price here. The the arsenal so far this year um, is, is actually pretty okay. Not a lot has changed in terms of usage. Still about 29% on the two-seamer, still about 12% on the four-seamer. A um, little bit more of the change, tick and a half to the upside or something like that. But ha he has mostly halved the, the curveball usage and moved it just over to the slider here. So throwing the slider here at a full 45% of the time now, um, I mean, a two ticks is two ticks, but it's a good pitch for him. And everything has been pretty good so far. 
really not overly susceptible in in the changeup. Um, throwing this at about you know, what 10 percent or whatever. So the curveball is basically down to what four percent, and that's been moved to the slider change. Uh, so he's trying to keep the baseball down in the strike zone still and get a little bit more swing and miss to the left side. And he's accomplished that so far in the in the early going here. Really good change of value. Just a couple of starts for, for Disco, but um, encouraging stuff for sure. In his last outing, he went a full eight, struck out just three, uh, but that was against Houston and didn't give up any runs. So K stuff is probably going to hover at about, I don't know, three quarters of a of a K per inning. So we need to see overall the the aggregate swinging strike and K rate numbers come up. But Disco at this point is, is trying to keep the baseball down and just not get blown apart by left handers as he has in the past. Um, now, he's still throwing the sinker a lot, as I mentioned, still 29, 30%. And it's not a good pitch against the right side. So we have uh, upside concerns for Disco in this particular spot because the Nats aren't going to strike out a lot, just a 20% aggregate K rate for them, but they're not going to hit for any power. 099 ISO and a 76 WRC plus here, no hard contact, buck 60 ground ball to fly ball. So this is a good suppression spot for Disco, and he might be able to pop for about, you know, uh, one, 1.2 Ks an inning or so and go six or, or even a full seven innings. So I think this is a playable spot. Uh, also, probably prefer Disco in cash, but you could mix him in a little bit in tournaments, I think, as sort of a late-night pitcher hammer, if you will. Uh, I like the price tag at 81. I think this is playable relative to some of the other guys in this same sort of range. Like, I'd much rather play Disco than John Gray, for example. Um, even in a, a worse strikeout matchup. So, don't usually like going after the Nats, just because they're pesky, but he can suppress here, and he can win this matchup, definitely. Um, if you are going to play some of the Nats, ugh, I'm, I'm really not wild about this. You could play a little bit of Jamer. Uh, you could play some Luis Garcia. He's been fantastic. Um, and from the left side, that's probably it, I would think. Don't really want to play any righties against Disco. The slider is still a very good pitch, and he's got a high ground ball rate, pushing a buck fifty uh, to the right side. So... If anything, it would be attacking some changeup regression and some sinker heavy usage here uh, with left-handers like a Luis Garcia from the Nats, but mostly side with Disco here. Not overly crazy about upside in tournaments, but uh, I like this as a cash play. I think it's a decent suppression spot. Uh, okay, that's it for the breakdown, and I think we kept it under an hour today. Uh, yeehaw. So quickly, let's go over stacks to kick us over an hour. Um, mostly the Yankees here in... In New York, I uh, think you can play some Nestor. I'm not wild about early ownership figures on him, though, to be honest. And I think you could play, in order to get off of some of that ownership, you could play some short Oakland stacks here. Uh, they could be a little bit sticky against lefties, and I'm not overly thrilled with the uh, pitch mix changes so far for Nestor. Uh, Dodgers-Milwaukee, you could play a lot, of, a lot of angles in this game. You could target a bad, or what has been bad, um the Dodgers bullpen over here and maybe a short lease on Tony Gonsolin. Potentially he's going to be stretched out a little bit more. So you could play him as well. I like the price tag at 7,300, but you can also play Freddie and Brewers uh, over here at what? 8,600, I believe uh, for Freddie. And you can target the Dodgers who are striking out a crap load. So interesting tournament game here. I think you play pretty much all angles. Uh, White Sox and KC. White Sox is going to pop really hard in ownership today. I'm not super thrilled about it because I don't like going after Granky, and I don't think the White Sox are all that good, to be quite honest. Uh, not that I'm going to play Granky or anything, but and also not that I'm really going to play all that much of Dylan Cease. I, I think I'd rather get to some Royals over here. Uh, very discouraging changes in the arsenal, and, and Dylan Cease just can't throw any strikes whatsoever, losing a lot of value on a four-seamer, which is basically been hovering at league average for the last couple of years and that's tanked so that increases his variance a lot more his walk rate's just too high st louis and the cubs uh michaelis no thanks um he's getting zero value out of any of his fastballs as well but unfortunately the weather and and pricing for the cubs over here in chicago kind of keeps me off I, I do like stroman though a little bit and 8800 i'm not jacked about 
Um, but I think you could play him as a, uh, you know, just kind of mix him in in some of your tournament teams. Uh, Houston and the Angels, mostly Houston here. A lot of Hunter Brown. I like this. Um, probably no Angels for me tonight. You can play some Texas. I do like Gilbert uh, a little bit more than like a Nestor or something like that. Uh, certainly more than like a Dylan Cease. But you can play some Texas too. This is a very good lineup over here. And, and Gilbert still got some vulnerabilities to the right side. Encouraging with the split change though. Um, no John Gray for me. You can play some Seattle if you want. Uh, I, I think targeting John Gray, he's losing a lot of value in a pitch mix too. Miami and Arizona, just the D-backs here, pretty much exclusively. Maybe some Jazzy uh, or some Luis Arise cash pieces or something like that. But you want to play Luis Arise and cash against Zach Gallen? I mean, woof. Um, so Zach Gallen and the D-backs almost exclusively. Washington and San Francisco, mostly just San Francisco here. And a little bit of Disco, uh, probably almost exclusively staying off of Washington here. So hopefully that helps, guys, and that gives you a little bit of a basis from which to work when you start building your teams. Um, once again, keep an eye out for projection updates. We'll be pushing those throughout the day as lineups, news, and et cetera, and all, all that come in. Um, so that's it for Monday's eight-game main slate. We'll catch you uh, tomorrow for Tuesday. Good luck.